Kama Sutra has Amrita Narayanan, Anant Padmanabhan, and Margaret Mascaranis in conversation with Janice Pariot. Hello, my panelists. We're starting. <laughs> okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and it's lovely um, to be here in Chennai with you all and with my absolutely wonderful panelists. So we're at a session that's rather delectably called um, Karma's Sutra, and we're meant to be discussing um, erotic fiction in connection to um, the, the writing that um, my panelists have done. Um, so very quickly, I'm going to introduce them. Um, the lady on my left is Margaret Mascarenas. She is an Indo-American and Native American um, poet and writer, <laughs> dearly beloved by all. <laughs> um, she's the author of Skin, um, a novel, and also a collection, a beautiful collection of poetry called Triage, Casualties of Love and Sex. And she lives in Goa. Um, then we have Amrita Narayanan, who is a clinical <laughs> psychoanalyst, and she lives in Goa as well. She's the author of the most wonderful collection of short stories called A Pleasant Kind of Heavy and Other Erotic Stories, which if, if you haven't picked up until now, you absolutely must. Um, it's beautiful and sensual and delightful and delicate. Um, and I'll stop now, but you get the picture. <laughs> really beautiful. And then we have Anant on my far, far um, left. And he has been working in publishing for a very long time. He was with Penguin India for about 18 years. And now he's the CEO um, of HarperCollins India. And he's a self-confessed dog lover and bibliophile. And he also is the author of a novel called um, Play With Me. Um, so to begin with, I'm going to start with uh, Margaret and Amrita. I have a question actually for the both of you. Um, they both sent me some other writing that they've done, some other non-fiction writing that they've done, and I noticed great similarities um, in their essays. Margaret sent me um, an essay called She slash He Generous shape-shifting across the river, and Amrita sent me an, um, an essay called The Nonfiction of My um, feminis Feminism, um, which was in the Stockholm Review. Um, and they both, um, interestingly enough, talk about reading, um, and in the case of Amrita, not reading um, certain kinds of fiction, certain kinds of nonfiction. They talk about how their books and their writerly selves grew out of the reading um, that they've done in the past. In fact, in um, Amrita's um, essay, there's an interesting line where she says, feminism, I decided, was being able to write intimately about young girls and women. And I was wondering um, if you could um, give us a context within which a pleasant kind of heavy transpired from the readings and the non-readings that you did. Um, so that's the, the first question. And Margaret, um, you say something similar. Um, reading appears to have trumped environment long before it was transformed by experience and feeling, long before I read any comprehensive gender studies. Um, and I'd like to know what these literary witches are um, in your past. Why witches? And are you a literary witch? So Amrita, would you like to start? Yeah. Is this, yeah, it's on. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, you're asking about the readings that, and non-readings that informed my writing. Um, well, I think non-readings is a very particular question which I actually try to address in the essay. And I think one of the reasons that I was able to write this book is that I avoided reading the newspapers for a number of years, particularly the Indian news, in which uh, the reports about young women being raped, uh, Eve teased, were so um, constrictive to the 
process of erotic narrative and, and in, I believe also to the development of young women that I avoided reading the newspapers initially not knowing why and uh, understanding that only retrospectively uh, that not reading about rape, about sexual harassment creates a kind of a internal privilege where you can then think and write about these topics uh, from a position of relative safety that in fact it's, it's not actually available, uh, that safety, if you're fully immersed in the reality of, of the outside world. So I think that's how I shielded myself. Um, and, and then I found actually after I wrote this book that slowly I was able to read more and, um, and digest more of, of what I read because um, in a sense I think I'd uh, promised myself that look, it's okay, you're going to have this space and the outer reality won't intrude and destroy it. Uh, both can, can, can coexist. And so Pleasant Kind of Heavy is your feminism. It is writing intimately about young women, young girls, um, and it sort of grows out of the non-readings that you haven't done. Um, Margaret? No? Thank you. Is this on? Yes. Okay. Hmm. You, you asked me if I recall now uh, what kind of, who were my literary mentors? Yeah, and who, witches. My and literary, like uh, which I yes. refer to as literary witches in this essay. The essay itself is, uh, will be out in a new HarperCollins anthology, I think in a couple of, of weeks, actually. And um, so the context in which I, I was talking about what influenced me and who influenced me and who sort of raised me as, you know, earlier I would have said feminist, but I have evolved into thinking about uh, feminism and whether I want to call myself that um, differently as I've gotten older because of the political connotations that it raises in the same way that I, I feel that I need to also distance myself from uh, declaring whether I'm a feminist or whether I am gay or whether I am straight and take a firm position because the essay is essentially about fluidity, fluidity and especially uh, sexual and uh, identity, the, the right and the ability to be fluid in these areas, but more importantly, the right to, to uh, be fluid. So I was raised, I don't know um, whether I, that's in my bio or not, but uh, although I was born in the US, I, I was raised, I left at a very early age for Venezuela, where my father was invited to consult for the Ministry of Public Works there. And so I pretty much grew up in Venezuela and I cut my teeth on uh, a lot of uh, black and South American literature. So when you talk about witching, I mean, I, I really did cut my teeth on uh, magical realism, I suppose. I grew up with that, it was very natural to me, and there are in, a lot of, influence of that, uh, influences of that in my own work. But I would say that um, one of the most influential writers for me as a young girl was Alice Walker. I had a very enlightened librarian in my school in Venezuela, which was an American school, but also included the Venezuelan syllabus. And Alice Walker was the first uh, feminist black novelist that I had really uh, read. And she introduced the, the idea of gender fluidity to me then. And it, so it, that the seed would have been planted when I was in my teens, late teens or so. And, but it only came to fruition in my life and in my work, I would say, in the past eight years. So am I a literary witch is what you ask me? I suppose we all are, you know. I mean, we're creating some kind of alchemy to the best of our ability, so I, I, I suppose so. 
Um, so Anant, um, who are your literary witches? And you know, you've been a publisher, and you choose to write your first novel um, as a sort of you know a literary fiction, uh, a literary erotic fiction, um, and it's. I don't know if, if any of you have read Play With Me, but it is, it's racy and pacey. I can't believe I just said that, but it's racy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's, it's hugely sort of modern and contemporary, and it, it reminded me a little bit of sort of a very James Bond-esque kind of sort of, you know, world. Um, you know, of course, without the... The, the, yeah, the Secret Service and the government and all of that, but, but generally the kind of, you know, spectacle within the book. Um, um, and I was just wondering how, why? First, first novel, this is what you do. Okay. Uh, I, you know, we all, we all have girly magazines as we grew up and so to speak. So a lot of my early impulse was visual, as is always the case, continues to be. But having uh, had the opportunity to work in a work amongst books and so on, being exposed to the whole gamut of books that deal with relationships and breakups and story of O and Henry Miller and you know even penthouse letters or whatever, but there was just a pass. I didn't ever think that I'll write an erotic novel ever. It started one day with a delayed meeting in Delhi. I was waiting to have you know the meeting got pushed. I ironically went to a Sarana Bhavan in Janpath, ordered a filter coffee, and a, and a story popped in my head, which is uh, two boys from, oh, uh, audible, yeah. They are in New York, and they want to take a break. The guy suggests, why don't we go to a strip club? They do. And uh, this girl called June walks over to one of the, the narrator, and he thinks he recognizes her and that for, from a birthmark on her right arm. And she happens to be his father's best friend's daughter that he last met in Madras at a beach house party. So the story kind of leaves it open to why is she dancing here, what happened to her past and so on. And I just let it be. My colleagues had read it. Um, many years later, E.L. James became a phenomenon. And then there were writer, women writers who were writing erotic or sensual or books and stuff like that. And then in a, in a, in a simple conversation in an acquisitions meeting, everybody said, you know, you've written that story, why don't you give a novel a shot? Uh, I took about a day to think about it and I went back to the publisher and said, why don't I? Um, and then I said, fine, let's do it. So I plotted the novel. Uh, I wanted to call it Play With Me. That title had popped up right in the beginning, but then I didn't know a thing about writing a novel or stitching it together. Um, so I opened an Excel sheet, as boring as it may sound, and I said, who are these people? What is going to happen to them? I had set 30 chapters in 60,000 words as my limit, and I said I was going to do that. Then came the whole pressure about how do you approach erotica uh, if the protagonist is male and it's a first-person narrative, and I hadn't learned to write in any other person. Um, I think working and living with really strong-willed, independent women um, helped me a lot to think about the kind of women who would populate my book. Then I became very aware to every relationship impulse or every meeting or every, you know, how they stand and body language and what do people say and how to react and it all became part of what I would build. And then I didn't want to take the easy way out and place it in a publishing scenario. So I leaned on my sort of other creative impulse and set it in an advertising agency, which I thought will give me a little bit of, you know, take your liberties kind of thing. And when it came to the uh, sex itself in the book, I said I was going to push the bar. I said I, the people in my novel are going to be unapologetic about what they want from their bodies. And the book had to be about pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, sex was part of it. But it was going to be a book about pleasure and what pleasure does to one's sense of love and uh, what really goes on in a man's head. So mm -hmm. that's the attempt. Um, so you are, interestingly enough, talking about sort of a grounding um, within your book in sort of, you know, um, sort of a certain reality in the way people behave and, you know, what they do and how they relate to each other. But there is a great deal of, of fantasy as well. Oh, yes, um, absolutely. absolutely. So could you there tell is us a certain, about that? Uh, there is a certain aspiration or aspirational sort of, uh, uh, what is it, background to where they live. So they're all rich, they're all good-looking. Like somebody sort of said to me, it's a, 
it's James a current Bond, yeah remember? it's a current johorization of an indian right. erotic novel in a way so it's a modern urban city that's not named they have holidays in goa they go to new york uh, and it's all bright and sunny and beautiful but most of the torment is within the characters and how they grapple with the fact that uh, it is a triangular relationship uh, they think they know what they want uh, they definitely want a lot of physical intimacy but what does it do to your heart and your head and what's the relationship mm -hmm. um in contrary to um to something like play with me then you have amrita is very um um in 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 a certain way um very sort of um i wouldn't i don't know if i want to use this word but it's mundane in the sense that these encounters happen in extremely sort of um you know um sometimes even domestic settings they are in in little spaces in the city in 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 beauty parlors in somebody's bedroom in you know under a, a certain bridge somewhere these are little glimpses into everyday life and they are um they sort of burst with with potential in a sense and i think that's what um is so powerful about um these stories that they are little sort of explosions and if i may use that um term and could you tell us about this um and i feel like it is genuinely something that you crafted quite carefully this mm -hmm. synesthesia of um very very visceral emotion and feeling and touch in in your stories yeah um i think for me that's what an indian eroticism is it's an eroticism of of daily life where you know you go to the panigal park market and the fruit is just glistening and people are buying it and they're just shopping with their whole bodies in a way that you would never see in a urban space um and yet at the same time the dialogue about sexuality and sensuality in these spaces is really has been until recently shut down or absent so uh the the sexuality of local life and of everyday spaces it's it's uber present and then it's silenced so th that's what um actually provoked me and the the first story that i wrote came after a trip to the market and uh in my sore and just walking back it it kind of occurred to me and and also i, I think there's a kind of a, a resentment or indignation in me that probably many people would relate to that so often sex in india is outsourced to goa and to the united states <laughs> it only happens over there <laughs> and so 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 my explosions as you put it are explosions uh, that are also assertions that actually it it happens here yeah. and there yeah. and everywhere we just don't happen to be able yeah. to to speak about it to talk about it in english to put language to it and right after um and this is from a story that's set in madras at that time and uh, called the causes of blindness the scarlet jewelry box was shaped like a closet Inside the indigo blue velvet that lined it had an indefinable fragrance that I longed to smell again and again. I did not have a name for it, so I could not call it up with words, necessitating frequent nuzzling to the velvet lining. Later, when I was in school, I decided that the lining smelled like cashew nut. But until then, it had been of little use to describe smells with other smells. that too did not have names the rectangular mirror with red yellow and green edges that someone had given amma as a take home gift at a wedding also smelled like the blue lining of the scarlet jewelry box the mirror had found its way out of its home in the vetla park bag into an embroidered orange bag that sat in my toy basket when my friend divya arrived we would play doctor doctor using a curtain to conceal ourselves and devising a makeshift clinic from a plastic stool thrust under the thick cotton cloth when it felt private enough divya would take my temperature and then offer the mirror as an antidote to my excessive heat she would slide the cool smooth glass into my panties where it would kiss the soft smooth hairless lips of my treasure box and sure enough draw the heat from me like condensing water does from a clay pot When the consultation was done, Divya took the mirror out of my panties and handed it back to me, and it smelled like the lining of the jewelry box. Cashew nut.
And this is from later in the same story. Love in literature, I announced the theme of school exhibition to my parents between mouthfuls of chapati and porlanga kutu, carefully extracting the offending pieces of porlanga from the delicious lentils in which they are swimming. I'm going to make a wall and I'm going to provide participants with scripts from Ovid's Pyramids and Thisbe, and we'll read to each other from behind the wall. I see that my parents are unimpressed by this explanation, and I'm forced to divulge more than I want to. I intend to provide an experience of the clandestine romantic. It will make the story relevant for today's participants. Appa raises an eyebrow quizzically, leaving me wondering if he's even heard me. Is he going to admit that he's been reviewing bullet points for his upcoming shareholders meeting instead of paying attention? No. He smiles and nods, good idea, good idea. Amma has been equally preoccupied. Her quarrel with Amma this morning has been exacerbated by the cook's inopportune announcement that she's going home to her village for a few weeks. However, she definitely perks up her ears at the word romantic. She is, like most women, more vigilant than her male counterpart when it comes to the consequences of wrong action. Amma and I have been wary of each other lately. Six months ago, going through my school notebooks, a routine practice she deems necessary because of my reluctance to communicate about my studies, she noticed the following entry in the etymology notebook that she herself had started for me. Pussy equals pucelle, virgin, origin French. I think she had never been less sure about where the boundaries of education should lie. Um, Margaret, in your writing, I've noticed um, that there is this, this great sort of juxtaposition and this great connection between violence, war, um, and erotica, and love, and sex. For example, in your novel, Skin, um, it opens in a scene of violence. It opens with the protagonist, Pagan, um, covering um, the war in Angola and she's deeply scarred um, by it. Your collection of poetry is called Triage, Casualties of Love and Sex, which, as you explain, um, is um, a term that is taken from um, the French paramedics during the First World War and how they would categorize um, the importance of, um, um, of treatment to wounded soldiers. So is your writing healing? Is your writing a wounding? Um, does love and sex and violence and war um, sort of do this, this dance um, together? Do they wrestle with each other? Are they in constant tussle? Okay, interesting. I had not thought of it uh, that way in terms of skin. Uh, <clears throat> And of course, I wrote it such a long time ago that I just can't even remember what I wrote practically now. Um, but yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think that, you know, sex and love and violence all do, uh, all are part of each other. And that, I mean, even to have an effective story, something has to happen and some, it has to get resolved one way or the other, whether it's a healing or not a healing. I don't think that in my work, I mean, I can't remember, you know, thinking about it in those terms when I wrote Skin about a final resolution, but maybe because I was very much younger when I did it, that I, I did try to resolve things more. It was my first novel and I tried to resolve more. Um, but Skin is written about, a, uh, the subtext of Skin is, is the Portuguese slave trade. So clearly, I mean, that, that's an undercurrent and that's what the underpinning of the entire novel around which the family saga over generations is told. So of course, slave trading is a violent act. Now, with, in the context of triage, which came out recently, um, it is my theory that romantic love is a terminal illness. It is not normal and it... <laughs> Yes, it's just, I, I mean, that's what I was trying to express. Uh, uh, th th this collection of poetry just sort of popped out after, I was, not, I was, I was working in 
uh, at running a prison art program in Goa for uh, inmates who were unlikely to get out anytime in the near future, and that was taking all of my time and the accounting and the, bureau, the red tape and the actual hands-on teaching that I was doing. So I couldn't work on the novel that I had in mind. And I was also going through a really ugly breakup, which now I, I find a bit comical, but at the time, of course, because love is an illness, you think you're going to die. <laughs> And when I talk about love, I'm, not t I'm talking specifically about, in this context, about romantic love. I don't think it's a normal state. I don't think anybody can say that they can maintain that state throughout their life with one other individual. Mm -hmm. And to my mind, which I think I do mention maybe in the introduction, mm -hmm. the kind of love that, is, you know, that, that I would like to cultivate is the one where your partner, if you have a partner, uh, becomes your best friend, and it's a it's a, it's a different kind of love entirely, and much more soothing to the mind and body. Now, whether you can maintain a, a, a sexual uh, attraction in all of that, I don't know. I've interviewed people, and they all have different reactions mm -hmm. to that. But that ties up with your earlier question about, you know, if it's not a war, is it sexy? I, you know, the verdict is still out. <laughs> That's true. Actually, if there wasn't the promise of pleasure, I think romantic love would just lose so terribly. Right. Uh, there is love and there is romantic love and I think pleasure plays such an important part. Sorry? Huh? Oh, I'm talking oh, to Mike, okay. yes. I see yeah, that's what I'm saying, yes. all need to do that. Oh, yeah, we're not used to it. Um, well, if you'd like to read a couple of poems, then I have another question um, for you. Um, would you like to read from, from yeah, your poetry? I, so I'm not sure whether this is a poem, but, and, but this is how it came to me in the middle of the night, and I always keep a notebook next to my bed. Sirens. Sirens, wedding tongues, circling, necks, fragrancing, nipples, standing, legs, Wrapping, hips wilding, mouth stretching, eyes squeezing, liquid glass on pale silk sheets, sirens coming in silence so he won't hear. Eaten alive. Cannibal lover, you began with the lips, eyelids, earlobes, moving on to breasts. You bit too hard, down, 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 sucking on a sacred slit, gobbling body parts bit by bit, arms, legs, fingers, toes, back of neck, and even nose. Then you threw the clean bones down upon your plate with a clattering sound, Sated you began to snore so much free food. Was it a bore? <laughs> Here, I said, you forgot this part and offered you a spoon of heart. Thank you. Uh, this is one of my favorites and usually I have done this <clears throat> interactively with one or another of my panelists or with the audience, and, but it's been a while since I tried to orchestrate that, so I think I'll just uh, read it straight. It's called Echo Gets a Second Chance. White satin between my thighs, the stain of fresh berries on my li lips, a real rose in my hair, not cold silver. Can you see? I am cleansed with water of lavender. I am polished with oil of jasmine. Look at my skin glowing like a beacon, an invitation to others, not you. Observe me strumming the hair strings of my guitar. Observe me singing myself back to life. Observe this jubilant revelry of the senses. What did you say? I cannot hear you yelling. I cannot hear your toxic disdain. 
I cannot hear your chronic discontent. Look how I spit out the black crow. Look how I refuse the hot air. Look how I no longer receive your Trojan horses into my heart. Behold, narcissist, my voice no longer condemned to repeat. Behold how I repay a favor with a fountain of silver culled from behind your mirror. Thank you. Um, very quickly, I have actually a question for Margaret and for Anand. Um, in your essay, you've written, it is in India where I live and where I have come to espouse the notion that gender can be fluid, that at any point in a life one could fall in love with a person irrespective of gender. And I wanted to connect this to um, the flood of sort of erotic literary anthologies um, that we've been seeing um, in, in sort of India. Um, recently, um, the fact that we have queer fiction, um, the fact that we have, um, you know, um, straight uh, erotic fiction, the fact that we have queer fiction in Sri Lanka as well, apparently, and how these divides are sort of, um, you know, coming in within um, the publishing industry when we are trying to move towards a space where love is love. Um, where you fall in love with a person rather, as you say, irrespective of gender. Um, and Anant, of course, you're welcome to um, pitch in from sort of a publishing Actually, point I, of view. I find the opposite. Is this on? Yeah. I find it's the opposite. You know, I'm quite pleased that uh, what we call, I never liked the term queer, um, even before I myself decided to ex explore what is gender fluidity in my own personal life. Um, I think I, I welcome and applaud the fact that this literature is becoming integrated into the mainstream publishing. I think the line instead of, you know, is being blurred now and that we can just simply drop the use of the word queer altogether. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's so important. I think yeah. even, even in Amrita's book or in mine as well, the yeah. characters are, as in, Kara is a bisexual yeah. in my novel. Yeah. I think it, there's just not enough writing that explores sexuality the way it needs yeah. to. And we should stop. While categorization might be important, and I use that term very loosely to say that people know what they're getting. Mm -hmm. Choice is important. They like to read what, so mm -hmm. it's like humor or horror or whatever mm -hmm. it is. It's fine to subcategorize what the book holds in it. Uh, but we should have a lot more writing being published and a lot more mm -hmm. writing that should be written mm -hmm. in, in whatever form. Fact, and I'm not particularly a fan of anthologies, yeah. but it's useful as a beginning at least right. so that right. you, the, it's an opportunity for various voices to actually say what's going on in their minds and what's happening around us. Right. Uh, and, and it helps understand how, you know, how our views to sexuality has changed tremendously. Mm -hmm. I want to admit, you know, something that just popped into my head that's been bothering me, bothering me for quite a while in this mm -hmm. context, in this anthology that will be coming out in a, in a few weeks, um, I think it's, I think the title is now Walking Towards Ourselves. It is a, it's a, it's a anthology of women uh, essayists and I raised this point to, to the commissioning editors at the time that I was asked to contribute and um, to my knowledge I'm the only writer in that anthology who is addressing a quote-unquote queer subject and I was I was uncomfortable with that because I don't consider myself to be any kind of spokesperson for the gay queer community by community. I, I come from a different place. I'm talking about, I mean, I'm discussing my personal trajectory and I'm discussing a gender fluid trajectory which doesn't necessarily fall into the belief system or nor the politics of the queer community. So I would have, I would have been a lot happier, you, you're right, it is useful, but I would have been a lot happier if uh, writers who actu actually think of themselves and represent that community had been included in the anthology. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. pleasure is gender neutral 
and yeah. should be gender agnostic. Yes. In fact, it's what the body wants. Yeah. Sorry. No, I was just going to actually link, um, oddly enough, all your writing through this one particularly poignant um, strand that um, with all your writing, there is a wrestling to, to unbox, to unlabel. Um, there are no words um, that we generally think of as labels, gay, lesbian, bisexual, in any of your writing. In fact, it is removed. It's not there. Um, and that's something that I've noticed with, you know, with, with all of you. Um, Amrita, is that something you'd like to sort of talk about? Um, it just was just occurring to me as you were speaking yeah. that, that addressing identity yeah. uh, as such, is, it may not be something that we set out to do. Yeah. It's just something that maybe happens in the process and then putting labels on it kind of forecloses uh, the process, even the label that was put upon you, it, it just sort of forecloses your narrative and, and, and then of course the narrative of other people who are included with you. To define is to limit, as Oscar Wilde once said. <laughs> um, I'm going to quickly open this up for questions and I'm sure you all do have many, many questions. So very quickly put up your hands and um, they're all yours. Um, thank you for this um, delicious session. Uh, it was uh, good. Um, <laughs> yes, it was. And um, uh, this is not a question per se. I mean, I just wanted to uh, go back to one of the comments that Margaret had uh, mentioned. Um, as a person who is part of the queer community, both in Chennai and as well as in Delhi, um, I just wanted to reiterate on one point that, you know, regarding the gender fluidity, um, you, you, were, you said that you're not sure whether gender fluidity is part of the politics or the belief system of a uh, queer community. Um, but someone who is part of the community, I would uh, just want to say that it is very much part of the queer community. The queer community believes in gender fluidity and it is one of the politics. And there are many people who identify themselves as gender fluid. So yes. it's a gamut, a spectrum of uh, sexual identi identity and uh, gender orientation that the queer community yeah. believes in. That's exactly what you were saying. I actually. think I was referring to that, and you know, I, I mean, we're we're saying the same thing, except that yeah. I felt that I should not be the right. one yeah, because I, I, I yeah yes. because um, I would consider myself. Uh, not a good spokesperson right. for rights, except the right to be fluid. Right. So that's what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I, I did and get I that. I also, yes. I did go to, to, I went to the university in the US, and when I was in the US, the, the, the militancy of both the feminists mm. at, and, and when I was in college in the 80s and the uh, gay community put me off. Okay. And I didn't, uh, I didn't want to be associated with either of those labels at the time. So I've had I a hear you. experience, mm -hmm. yeah. I hear you in those problems that you would have had with the gay community, but yes. Thank you. The lady here? Um, Ma this is for Margaret, mm -hmm. and this is not a question, it's a request. The last poem you read, you said you always do it in a duet with a person from the audience. Uh, and you didn't have the time to choreograph it, if over the afternoon you and I can do it together, we will oh, read wow. it here on the same thing. My name <laughs> is Preetam. Okay? Lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Quickly? Yes, yes. That gentleman over there. Excerpts. <laughs> yeah. Very? Very literal? Very what? Oh. You, you feel we didn't address the psychological aspects of it adequately. Yeah. Ah, well, we, what we read is probably a very small percentage of the... Well, maybe you should choose to read it. Maybe, <laughs> and maybe you Check out the books, check out the text. I think you also need to check out the text. Uh, what's left out is a lot more enticing than what's 
put in. <laughs> the last, the last but not the least. Your liberty ends where my nose begins. Yes, we must remember it actually. Actually, India Sorry? is a different nation. It has got different culture and different civilization. It has got two parts, especially in Tamil Nadu, Agam, Puram. Something is to be discussed and you can be free within your, even within your private room. But when it comes to the question of society, we have got a social, political, historical, and cultural responsibility. It is easy to brittle and break every in a moment. It, ha it has been constructed for millions of years. Yes. By yes. What is what is you, right. your comment on it? Thank you. What did you say? Um, I'll, I'll start by taking that one. Isn't it a construction of patriarchy with men at the head of it, and specifically a caste-based construction with Brahmin men at the head of it? So. So to respect that, respecting that status quo would say that uh, circumscribing our liberties in order to uh, accord the proper respect to uh, wealthy, privileged uh, Brahmin males, uh, it just seems a bit outré. Yes. <laughs> uh, There's a lady there with a question. Uh. Hello, I'm actually the editor of the anthology that Margaret's been referring to. Here is the book. I just received it from HarperCollins. So it's launching um, next week. But I wanted to ask a question to all the panel, which is about the relationship between eros and words. Does, does language inspire you erotically? What is your experience of the eros of words as you're producing your work? Lovely. Yeah, uh, this question has come up quite often in, in discussions that I've had with other writers of erotica and, and I feel that, uh, I don't know how many of you might have uh, read or heard about Rosalind de Mello's uh, memoir that's also come out with Harper, A Handbook for My Lover. Um, the language, it's not necessary to describe a sexual act or to be, you know, uh, very specific about uh, sexuality uh, in order to be erotic. And so, yes, um, for those of us writing erotica, I think the language, the language itself can, can be sensual. And, and it doesn't even have to uh, mention at all any kind of sexual act, but it, it can, Erotica doesn't necessarily have to be sexual, it can be sensual, and that's enough. And then language serves as the vehicle for that, for me. Amrita? Yeah. I think words uh -huh. limit imagination in a way, but it, uh, horses for courses. If my book, called Racy, uh, there's a lot more description and I was constantly tormented about whether I'm getting it right uh, at all. And Sometimes it's, it's worth, sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult right. balance at all, actually. Um, but I think in writing sort of women-centered feminist erotica, uh, you know, words take on a particularly greater importance because there's so much unspoken uh, that becomes absent and invisible and, and it's, it's, a, it's a continuum between unspoken and, and we all know that something is meant or unspoken and disappeared, didn't happen, invisible. So uh, I think as writers, we're constantly playing with that and, and trying to get it right, uh, as you said. Shall we quickly make Anand read and then I we can disband? Anand read. Okay, quickly. Come on, go, before they throw us off the stage. So I think one of the, there are, there are two, um, two kind of themes in the book. One is, uh, what does pleasure do to one's sense of love, uh, is one. Uh, and the fact that Sid as a character believes that you can absolutely be in love with more than one person at a time. So in the novel, he's, in, he's got Don't this sexually explain. charged relationship with a 21 year old girl. Don't explain. Don't tell. Yeah, okay, fine. So here it comes. So this is about Kara. They've come back to their apartment, they've just made love and uh, I think both of us passed out after that. When I opened my eyes, she was lying next to me, curled up, facing away. 
The early morning light streaming in through the large windows in her bedroom was a pale gold, and shining off her back made it seem like she'd been cast in gold herself. I reached over and touched her shoulder to see if she was awake. She turned around and smiled. You're mad. You're crazy, she replied. That was the best fuck of my life. I leaned over and kissed her, gently this time. No, I mean it. You're completely mad, I repeated. I haven't had so much fun with anyone. I enjoy being around someone so much. I haven't known anyone to be forever ready for sex as you are. We haven't met in weeks, and we come home and you fuck my brains out. I absolutely love it, but I also feel guilty, like I'm just using you without treating you. She leaned over and covered my mouth with her hand, stopping me mid-sentence. Sid, not another word. Why do we have to dress up, find a nice restaurant for a quiet sit-down meal, treat each other nicely, share a joke or two, give each other knowing looks and come back home? And I know that one or both of us will do that with a tinge of unadmitted embarrassment, simply out of decency, and then make love. I like you, I love your body, love the way you look at me, the way you make love to me, the way, make, the way we make each other moan and come hard, the way your body shudders through an orgasm. I kept staring at her. What? Nothing, go on. Can I be vulgar? I smiled. I love the way your hard cock feels in my mouth and how you close your eyes and stop breathing when I suck you. I love it when you grab my ass tightly and drill into me. I want you to do it all the time. I love sex, Sid. I love it. So the next time, you just have to say it. She stood up and continued. There's nothing wrong in it, is there? Are you squeamish about this? And on that note... <laughs>